So, welcome everybody. I'm Tom Roscoe, and I'm the new university librarian over at the W. Knox Library next door here at FPS. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here. Uh, for our program today, we have um, Dr. Marty Mandelberg, um, uh, in, sorry, NPS Distinguished Professor Herb Loomis, and Professor Don Rutzman, who will give some reflections uh, on the teachings and research of Richard Wesley Hamming. Uh, with a discussion of the Richard Wesley Hamming Legacy Project. So I'd like to thank my colleagues from the NPS Foundation who helped uh, organize this. Um, also, particularly my colleagues in the um, Dudley Knox Library, um, Edward Corrado, who's Associate University Librarian, Irene Berry, who's our Digital Services Librarian, and George Gonzalez, who is our Restricted Resources Librarian, who helped coordinate these activities. Um, uh, the Dudley Knox Library is honored to be part of this presentation on the life and legacy of Professor Richard Wesley Hamming, and to be the stewards of Professor Hamming's archives. Um, we're also delighted to soon have more of Professor Hamming's research and um, teachings and videos and other things online and available through the NPS Institutional Repository, the NPS Online Archive, which is known as Calhoun. Um, previous to coming to NPS, I was the head of archives and special collections at MIT, uh, so I know a little bit about uh, archives and special collections and the history of technology. Um, and uh, upon my arrival here, I was delighted to learn about um, Professor Hamming's collection and that the, the library had it. And also that it's actually, a, you know, it is used and that it's the sort of the, the idea of Professor Hamming and his teachings and how he taught and how he was an inspiration uh, is actually still part of the process and the scholarship that's going on now. I think that's, that's really the purpose of archives. They are here to inspire others to hold up these, you know, wonderful historical figures, these wonderful historical events, organizations, and to inspire teaching and learning and to, and to understand that. So um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Martin Mandelberg, uh, who was spearheaded the Richard Wesley Hamming uh, Legacy Project. Dr. Mandelberg is a 1982 alumnus of the Naval Post Graduate School, and uh, also he was Professor Hamming's first and the only PhD student. Um, <laughs> which he'll tell you a lot more about in a second. Um, and Dr. Uh, Mandelberg spent many years working in government uh, and industry, recently retired, um, and to his full-time now job as mentor. So on that, thank you, Marty. <clears throat> well, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be back at Monterey. I arrived here in, 19, in September of 1977 as a 30 year old Navy GS-12 civilian who uh, the Navy chose to give me a fellowship to finish my PhD. I had been at the Naval War College a couple of years earlier and at the University of Connecticut for my Master's in Engineering and I was a design engineer working on some interesting problems in sonar and acoustics and signal processing and a number of people, including me, thought it would be nice if I got my PhD. So the Navy Laboratory in New London, Connecticut, sent me here, and uh, it changed my life. Both the school, the environment, the faculty, the administration, the staff, were all focused on excellence. It helped my career, and I had a very fine one. I'm not going to go over my resume, but um, it's on the internet, as is everything these days, you think. Richard Wesley Hamming. I'm going to, uh, this is the agenda short of what I'm going to do. Why did it come up here and not there? Ah, in the beginning and on the screen. I need some AP help up here. It happened again from the screen slideshow. Um, I think I see what it is. Nope. No, I'm stuck. I need PhD to get in electrical engineering, did you say? <laughs> Back when I was an electrical engineer, before they made me a manager, before they made a manager, things were uh, When you really need an engineer, you get the writer. Get the writer. Uh, this is Carla Orvis Hunt, my editor, writing coach, and good friend. And we were talking about technology. Sidebar, I have time here. When I did my research in signals identification uh, systems modeling, the UNIVAC 1108 computer had 128 kilobytes of magnetic core memory and two megabytes of 
uh, secondary rotating drum. This Motorola <laughs> droid has a 128 gigabytes of RAM and two terabytes of secondary storage, a factor of 10 to the sixth in 40 years. So thank you technology <laughs> and those who put it together. Uh, had I had this horsepower, I would have finished my dissertation earlier. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge some special guests. I'm going to talk about the legacy project and in particular my research findings. I'm going to summarize them. Please come in. Uh, I'm going to summarize. Anybody else? <laughs> We're offering drinks later. <laughs> Oh, and on that note, when this uh, is all over, uh, I'd like you all to be my guest at the Trident Room, if you wish. I've been three years. Uh, three years on the, or 30 months on this project. This finishes for me. Um, I'm going to talk about Richard Wesley Hamming, the man, the mathematician, the mentor, and then my legacy for him. And uh, conclude with uh, what Hamming accomplished, attempted, and accomplished. You should be rewarded for what you attempt, because there's things to be learned in failure. Hemming knew that. What contributed to Hemming's success? Why study Hemming? Hemming died 20 years ago. There's a reason to study him and honor him. If he was here today, what would he tell us? And then give some thoughts of my own. As any adjunct professor, we have to add a little bit of our own. Okay, um, uh, be... Okay. acknowledgement, uh, distinguished Professor Hirsch Loomis um, on the front row was Richard Wesley's Hamming's, I will say, best friend for the 22 years that they were both here. And Hirsch, thank you for your support in proceeding with this project. We'll hear a little bit more from him in a moment. Uh, Professor Don Brutzman is hiding somewhere. Don, there is the back corner. Uh, Navy background. Also has helped a lot. He'll be talking a little bit. Tom Roscoe, who just introduced me, thank you. Eleanor Ulanger, the former head of the Dudley Knox, um, said, oh, we have a special collection and there's eight sealed boxes that no one's been in for 19 years. Would you like to look at it? And I was salivating yeah. the sides of my mouth because Eleanor and Irene and I peeled open the boxes and in there was a treasure trove the contents of Richard Wesley Hamming's desk, both here at the office and at home. His wife, Wanda, donated it here. Uh, his niece, who I'll talk for a moment, Karen uh, Hamming-Werner, uh, also contributed to it. So I'm going through these boxes. I felt like Indiana Jones <laughs> in one of the movies, and I'm opening it up, and I'm glad that a snake didn't come out, but everything else came out his own personal notes, his copy of his Bell Labs um, notebook where he developed error correcting codes for which he won the Turing Award, um, his poetry to his wife, um, the physical Turing Award I held in my hand. I wasn't supposed to, I know, but it's a gold medal, the Turing, it's the Nobel of Mathematics, the Hamming Award from the IEEE, the Edward Reams Award, many other certificates and things of a world-class mathematician. That started me on my path, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the path. Um, um, uh, Provost Steve Lerman, thank you for being here, and thank you for your support over the last year and a half on uh, getting to this day. Uh, Irene Berry, Special Collections, thank you, Irene, for things. Edward Corrado, and uh, is, is anyone here from the NPS Foundation? I'm sorry, I don't recognize anybody here. Well, they, they help facilitate setting up the archives. Okay, special guests. Um, Karen Hamming-Werner is the niece of Richard Wesley Hamming and her husband, Jim Werner, and their uh, family came down from Bellevue, Spokane, Washington. They're in the back row, all waiting for the drinks of the train. <laughs> but they're the only heirs of Richard Wesley Hamming. He had no children. So his older brother, who I'll be talking about in a moment, is Karen's father. Come on in. Thank you so much. Um, my son, manning the computer, and the, manning the video, is ever going to keep, is my son. Uh, Car uh, Carla Orisanda already talked about. Uh, Larry Reeves, a good friend up here in the front row with a wild 
He's wearing the hamming tie, and we'll talk about why did hamming wear a red plaid. It's a secret you may not know. Hirsch, maybe you could put that in. You know the answer to that. If not, I will. As to why? Well, why did Richard wear a red coat? Do you have the answer? Not, not now, but when you talk? I'll defer to you. I'll slide it in at the moment, from it. And um, I'll, I'll be honest, I never knew. I do. I do. Although he had three of them. He actually, I believe he had like uh, more. They were all yeah, bespoke more. jackets made overseas. Um, is anyone here from Monterey Institute of Research? Bruce Weaver? Uh -huh. Bunch of us, yeah. The, 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 okay, we'll talk more about them. Thank you all for coming. Moving ahead. Okay. Richard Hamming was born 1915 in Chicago. It did. I hate Is it, it when freezing? I what am I doing wrong? Go uh, back to from beginning and then skip ahead. From beginning? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm that's going that's to. That's how I fix it. Yeah. Now it's not wanting to skip ahead for me. Would you come up again? Technology's crazy. And it's my computer, too, I should have. That's the funny part. The um, error correcting algorithm is working furiously. <laughs> <laughs> As if we have time, I'll tell you whatever. I'll answer questions. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hang out close by. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, what I'm giving you is a highlight of 30 months of research, probably uh, 500 pages of writing and documents that I've created probably all together about 30,000 pages of research findings that I was able to obtain which are available to go into the archive. Okay, um, so Hamming's uh, contributions are the lasting impacts, mathematics, computer science, engineering, and telecommunications, and I'll tell you why. He was a professor here at Monterey from 1976 until his death. What do I press? This arrow button. I, the arrow button? Yeah, this, oh, that's why. You should go like this. Oh, it's that arrow button. It's the side arrow button. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Hemming grew, uh, lived in interesting times. Being born, he was born in 1915. When he graduated high school in 1932, we had just gone through the stock market crash. The Depression was going on. Chicago was an immigrant town. And his family was poor. The little bit of money that they had was wiped out by the stock market crash. So Hamming gave the following quote. I was born on West Side. I did not want to be as poor as my parents. I did not, did not want to be rich. But I, you, you, I wanted reasonable money. I can, you can read it. This was his motivation. He wanted to have choices in life, sort of like the way we all do now. But he, his family had no financial aid for him. He went to a couple of three junior colleges uh, in a row. Two of them failed during the Depression. He finally graduated Crane Junior College. He wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And the only school that accepted him, because he had good grades, was the University of Chicago. And they did not then, and I believe still do not now, have an electrical engineering department. Surprise. But they had a math department, and he was good at math. And they gave him a scholarship, and he finished his bachelor's degree. Uh, at the University of Chicago. He later went on to get his master's at the University of Nebraska in math and his PhD from the University of Illinois in 1942. But um, Hamming demonstrated some important traits which we sh might want to see if we have people around us who emulate these traits. He wanted to understand. He was a curious young man. He wanted to succeed. He wanted choices in life and he wanted to help others. That developed early. He was his class president in high school, Army ROTC. He did a number of things that demonstrated to me, once I got to the research, of the power of this young man. During his life and his education, he wanted to gain knowledge. He read everything. He was a voracious reader from science fiction to philosophy to every technical field during his life. He wanted to, you know, having knowledge is fine, but you need to focus to get wisdom and insight so that you can work on important problems and innovate and be successful. Okay. Um, in my research, I broke my research into three parts and then a closure. The man. 
I said, I see, I have to stand here. That's why I can't look at that. I can look up there. <laughs> so, so much for my speaker notes, which I can't see now. Who do you know? I don't need them. Um, so I focus on his family's heritage. His father was born in Holland, a town called Kronika. You got to cough when you say that. Up in the northern uh, Netherlands, almost in Germany. And uh, I have his, uh, did, his, did his genealogy, his upbringing in Chicago, what was happening in Chicago. There was a 1932 World's Fair exposition in Chicago, which to a young high school graduate would say, wow, there's opportunities. There was Edison, there was Tesla, there were people doing things in the world. He grew up in interesting times. They were trying to live the American dream. It was an immigrant family. And the dream is opportunity. You could do whatever you wish. Um, and he didn't want to be as good as his parents. What helps people a lot in life, helped me, is role models. To some extent, his father, mother, brother James, four years older, maternal grandfather, what a name, Casper Lavatar Redfield. His friend Nicholas Metropolis, his future wife, Wanda Mae Little, and Waldemar Trzinski from the University of Illinois were role models. Of these, I'll show you why I believe his grandfather was his biggest role model until he got to his doctoral advisor. Hamming focused on education. He wanted to excel. He wanted to succeed. He didn't want to just get by. Some of his quotes were, luck prepares the favored prepared, luck favors the prepared mind from Pasteur, and preparation, 90%, 10% opportunity from Seneca. Okay, so pictures. Young Richard Wesley Hamming, top left corner. That's his mother uh, with his older brother, James. Walter. Walter, Walter. thank you. Walter. <laughs> Walter, sorry. High school yearbook, top middle. Nicholas Metropolis. There is uh, University of uh, Chicago. While at university, he liked to dance, and he was 21, and she was 16, and they went together until he finished his PhD and then married. This was his one girlfriend, as far as I know, in his life. And they were devoted to each other before they got married and for 56 years thereafter. University of Nebraska, what he looked like when he entered the PhD program. And uh, Wanda May Little was not a lightweight either. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa in English with her bachelor's and master's and a minor in teaching math. She was his partner in many, many ways and helped him become a better person. The role models, and James Walter, Walter James typo, sorry. Um, this is, I believe, Casper Laverture Redfield, to the best of my knowledge, the yeah. grandfather. He's playing checkers with Richard, with the brother watching. Maybe not, but I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and his doctoral advisor, Wodemar Trzinski, who was an interesting person, he had 51 doctoral students. Hamming was the 12th. <laughs> the 21st was a Dr. Ed Eby, who was at my wedding in Connecticut. Small world. <laughs> Um, no relationship. I did not know of Hamming at, you know, at that time window. Well, no, I'm sorry, I knew of Hamming at the time window. Trzinski would reach into his pocket and help pay the tuition and living costs for some of his students. He was that kind of giving mentor teacher. Hamming learned from everyone on this page. Casper Redfield wrote a number of books, and he was also a mechanical engineer, and he was an attorney. Mm -hmm. And in, my, in the archives, you'll find out more. He wrote this book in the year that Hamming was done, Great Men and How They're Produced. It's logical to believe that his paternal grandfather, who lived in Chicago nearby, would have taught young uh, Richard Wesley Hamming about how to be a great man and role models. This was a popular thing at the time. Okay. Hamming graduates, goes, um, teaches college during World War II, had a deferment because he was teaching military students math. And, uh, time, good. Um, and he gets a call, which turned out to be from Nick Metropolis. Oh, uh, we need you. Oh, where are you, Nick? Uh, in the Southwest. I can't tell you where. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why do we need you? I can't tell you, but we do. <laughs> I have a letter written by Wanda Hammond describing that it was almost a year that Nick Metropolis finally gave him enough information. And, and somehow the question was asked, is it important? And Metropolis was finally able to say, it will end the war. Hammond got on a train the next month, went to Los Alamos. His immediate boss was Hans Peta, who directly worked for Alan Oppenheimer. And their mission was to end World War II with the bomb. So Metropolis, the main gate of Los Alamos, behind Enrico Fermi and Richard Oppenheimer is an analog computer. They're trying to figure out how to do the physics and the math to design a bomb, which had never been done before. There wasn't the math. The analog computer is like a slide rule, something that your grandparents used and I used. And it's not accurate. And then there was the march on the calculator. You've all seen pictures or movies. Numbers is one of the movies where people would go 14725, enter, pull, times this, pull. And if you weren't dyslexic, you could get a product in about five seconds. Okay. But the problem was they had math to do. They were simulating a nuclear explosion because you couldn't do it in a laboratory. And they needed a digital computer, which had been invented. This Model 601 computer took a card image of variable A and variable B next to it, and in a, screech, in a very fast 4.2 seconds would multiply it and print out the card. No paper, no other trail. But by doing successive things with the digital computer, they verified the bomb design. Ham, Hemming called himself the computer janitor of science. <laughs> he worked with Beta. He worked with Fermi, Teller, Feynman to try to come up with what we now call computer simulation, numerical methods, to answer the physics questions, what's the right configuration so the bomb works? Imagine if Alamogordo Trinity had not worked, what would have Truman done? What would have happened to the lives of the Americans ready to invade the mainland of Japan? So it was important. Having did his part, and my research has a lot more findings, I'm just giving you a high level summary because we're on the time. So Richard Feynman, probably in my opinion and many others, the, the best physicist since Einstein, is brilliant. Um, Alamogorda happened on the 16th of July, the Trinity explosion, and those who were there received this lapel pin. Tom, this lapel pin is in your archives. So that's, um, okay, after 18 months, okay, after the bomb went off, Hamming stayed on and documented this new field called computer simulation and using numerical methods and solving open-ended problems and doing partial differential equations, which is what his PhD dissertation was in, by the way, but on a digital computer, which relays. This is before ENIAC. This is, you know, most of the computers you may have studied in your history books were after World War II. This is at the end of World War II. Um, so Hamming, because he had done a good job, I got invited to come to Bell Labs, and he stayed there 30 years. His immediate boss was George Tibbetts, who had invented the relay digital computer that Hamming used at Los Alamos. And the design went to IBM, who manufactured it. Okay. So at Bell Labs, there was a person called Claude Shannon. Anyone in communication theory should know who Claude Shannon is. There were a group of five, um, Ling, McMillan, Shannon, Hamming, and John Tukey. Fast Fourier transforms. Um, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force later on. All of these worked at Bell Labs. They were all scientists or mathematicians. And they helped Bell Labs uh, become preeminent in its field. Many patents followed. Hemming got three patents and three books. One of them is error correcting codes. Um, Tukey, who was also uh, head of the statistics department at Princeton, um, the fast Fourier transform, the whole frequency domain. Um, they were called the Young Turks because they were given a free reign and they did wonderful things. More will be found in the archives that I donate from the labs. Hamming helped many people. 
there were 17 tech memos that I finally was given access to by the historian at Bell Labs, Mr. Ed Eckert. Um, and I'm working to get the release of those tech memos because it's been you know, 35, 40 years since anyone's looked at it to put in the archives to show what else Hamming worked on, including Tukey and the Fast Fourier Transformer. Hamming altogether wrote nine books, three while at Bell Labs, um, over a hundred uh, technical articles, many, many lectures, taught many courses, was a visiting uh, professor at Princeton City College of New York, NYU, um, uh, Rutgers, um, Stanford, and UC Davis during his sabbaticals. He liked to teach. I'm gonna find why that comes out. At the end, here's Hamming with the Vice President of Research, Bernard Holbrook, demonstrating error correcting codes. Does anyone need any discussion? Error correcting codes guarantee that when you send a message, in case it gets corrupted, you don't have to resend it. It cleans itself. For that, you got a patent. His first paper is 1947, 48, on the same time that Shannon wrote about information theory. Hamming wrote about error correcting codes. They were office mates at Bell Labs. <laughs> There was something magic in the air, said Hamming. <laughs> and they both went on to greatness. Shannon back to MIT and into cryptography and classified work. And Hamming also. And we'll talk about that in a minute. After 30 years, Hamming decided that it's best to leave research for the younger people. And he retired in 1976. OK, uh, too many words. The mathematician. Hamming became a mathematician at Los Alamos. Before that, he was a math professor. At Los Alamos, he had to apply math, not theoretical math, practical math, to design the bomb. At Bell Labs, he had to do practical math to help Bell Labs become the preeminent research place for telecommunications. Um, during his, so he was a research mathematician, he helped many people, he was very comfortable being the number two banana. He didn't have to be, whenever he was promoted to a management position, he quickly <laughs> transferred everyone off so he had no staff and went back to being a research mathematician. When he retired, he was the vice president of research, working for Ian Ross, the president of Bell Labs. Extremely well thought of. When I close, I'll tell you how well thought he was of the Bell Labs. So he retired, and he asked his wife, Wanda, you've been following me around for 32 years. Where do you want to live? And Wanda said, I have a friend in Monterey, California. Hamming says, great, I know the area from when I was at Stanford. And besides, the weather is better than New Jersey. <laughs> and the Hammings moved out here in 76. And um, he approached um, the uh, deans here said, I would like to teach. And they said, of course, Dr. Hamming. Oh, sorry, by the way, in 1968, Hamming was awarded the ACM Turner Award, which is the Nobel of Math. Well, and so that's a pretty heavy uh, thing on your resume. So when he came here, they said, Professor Hamming, what can we do for you? And Hamming says, I would like a position to teach, to write books, and have master's students but I don't want to do the academic things that every other professor has to do. I don't care what you call me. In fact, I want to work for you, the provost, not the department head. And they said, they talked about it, and they said, okay. And they said, but we're concerned that this is a government college. You could get twice as much money at Stanford or work for a major contractor in 1976. Hemming says, I have enough money from Bell Labs. Money is not, I want to write my books. I want to help people. I'm going to teach. So they came to a compromise. He came aboard under those conditions. And um, while here, um, he taught a number of courses. Don Brutzman will talk about his experience under Richard Hamming. He had um, four master students, four or five, that he was the primary advisor. Uh, four students, he was the secondary advisor. And to cut it short, he had one doctoral student. He didn't want a doctoral student. But the department head came to him and said, you really need to examine this person to see if we can help out. That doctor was me. So that's why I've done this project. <laughs> Real simple. As a tribute to my mentor. 
So, uh, starting in 1944, it was Metropolis. Hamming traits allowed him to be one of the founders of the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM. Uh, senior in the IEEE, a reviewer of a number of articles besides being an author. American Association of National Science. He was a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He was well thought of in, by his peers. And Tukey, when doing the fast Fourier transform, created something called, or coined the phrase, Hamming window. And Hamming said, John, you know, I only helped you a little bit. And John Tukey says, if it wasn't for you, Hamming, I wouldn't have completed it. It's going to be called the Hamming window. So Hamming is known for three main things codes, error correcting, the Hamming window, and the Hamming distance, which is an extrapolation into more dimensions. Those three things are on the brick here in front of Spanical Hall that Juan did. So um, now I'm going to go on to mentor. I talked about the man, the mathematician, the mentor. He developed early on skills, knowledge, and insights to mentor people. He liked doing that. He liked being the research mathematician that helped you with your problem. He was a perfect professor to help people with their master's thesis. Because he could hop from problem to problem. I, uh, doc, I've, as his doctoral student for three and a half years, I've documented my time with him. And that's going into the archives. I interviewed 20 individuals, some of which I'm going to tell, talk about right now. Um, and some who are in this room. And they're all, their memories of Dick Hamming going back as far as 1957. Um, Doug uh, McElroy worked for Hamming in 1957. Brian Kernigan was in the office next to him in 1967 at Bell Labs. Ben Schneiderman was a professor at University of Maryland in the same late 50s, early 60s, was a student at City College of New York. These are all distinguished professors with math graduate students of their own. Karen Hamming Werner, Richard's niece, and her family are here. Karen remembers Dick Hamming in 64, something like that, in the 60s, um, when you came back to New Jersey and, and found out that you had an uncle who was a Bell Labs mathematician, um, and then followed him throughout life. Um, Hirsch Loomis, I talked to in Don Bressman. Their interviews uh, made the point I was trying to make in the book that Hamming is worthy of a legacy. Um, there was no halfway for Hamming. When Hamming got onto a problem, he didn't leave it until it was solved. Time and clock didn't matter. Richard and Wanda, a lot more relaxed than the other pictures here in beautiful Monterey, California. <laughs> Sitting in his office, okay plaid jacket time. Why did Richard Hamming, who is um, Dutch, wear a Welsh, Scottish plaid jacket? Hamming reported that he worked really hard on what he was ready to lecture on, and he thought it was important, so he wanted your eyes on him. Hmm. So the plaid jacket in the room. <laughs> Larry is wearing a plaid jacket. Her, I think you occasionally put one on. I, no, I don't have one. Ne never, never got one. So the Hamming Awardee, you have one on. So um, it exists we, somewhere. We, we gave a Hamming Award to Professor Jim Scrafani. Just last year. Uh, and, and Todd Wetter located a, a, a very good facsimile of this <laughs> jacket, which we presented to uh, to Tim. And Karen, any idea where the <coughs> after Richard no, passed? No, none. I understand there were between four and six of them. Yeah. They were bespoke, custom fit for him, um, but they sort of disappeared. It would be nice to have one someplace. Yeah. yeah. Heard of the archive. In the archives. Yeah. Um, this is Richard Hamming. I remember this pose, because in the middle of my research, I was doing numerical methods, and with now computers one millionth as powerful as this, and I found out that the Hamming window was suboptimal under certain conditions. And Richard Hamming, who always only used last name, he would call you Mandelberg. Mandelberg, are you telling me that 
the Hamming filter, which is named after me, is suboptimal? <laughs> and I correctly said, yes, Professor Hamming. He says, good job! Because <laughs> he knew. Okay. If Hamming were here, there are many, many Hamming quotes, and I think Don will give a couple, maybe Hirsch will. There's too many for me to do all. But if you don't work on important problems, it's not important. It's not likely you're going to do important work. His book, Numerical Method for Scientists and Engineers, which is translated into four or six languages, including Russian, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. One of his others, better to work on the right problem the wrong way, because at least you're working on the right problem <laughs> than the wrong problem the right way, because who cares if you're working on the wrong problem? I like number four, the emotion at the point of technical breakthrough is better than wine, women, and song are together. <laughs> when you got it, you know you got it. When your thesis is accepted, when you've solved a hard problem. On his door, I think Hirsch did surely. Uh, she calligraphed that, yes. Good teachers get apples, great teachers get chocolate. And like chocolate. He was a human being. This is Richard Hamming, one of his last photos. Wanda passed away in 2008, one of her last photos here. They donated um, the bit of the estate that was left. And actually, I don't. Oh, Just hit any bar. Any, any bar? Try it. <laughs> well, yeah, you're good at bars. Is the Andy bar? That's a good question. The O-N-O-F-F key. Okay. Well, I can talk to you about the last. I don't need the last chart. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Well, you keep talking. I'll try to do okay, it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, boss. My tribute to Richard Wesley Hamming is in a, a quote that I'd like to say. A person's legacy should not be limited by what they attempt and accomplish, by just what they attempt and accomplish in their lifetime. It should include what is attempted and accomplished by the succeeding generations that they enabled. That's why a professor teaches. That's why a research mathematician helps other research mathematicians. My legacy to Richard Hamming is the phrase I'm going to use, which is ripples. If you drop a, a pebble in a pond, you see a two-dimensional ripple going out. Hamming was into nonlinearity and causality, and nonlinearity causality yields something called a fractal. Happens to be Mandelbrot, nothing related to Mandelberg. Fractal. So I've coined the term to describe Hamming's mentorship of people, <coughs> lowercase h, Hamming ripples and in the documentation that will follow is my tribute to him. Thank you very much. Do you want to pass on to... Uh... I'm sorry, Hirsch. Please. <laughs> Professor Lomas. Dick. Hamming was uh, a good friend uh, and a valued friend. Uh, one of the great privileges of my career was to be able to work with uh, this intellectual giant uh, on a daily basis. You know, he would drop into your office and for, to talk about ideas. And there was one occasion when I actually uh, stimulated something in his brain that answered a question that he was raising. Uh, and I thought, geez, you know, <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a success story uh, to be able to uh, stimulate something uh, that, that great in the, in the minds of, of, of such a such a person. Um, Dick, um, as I said, wanted to uh, discuss ideas. That was, that was the important thing to, uh, to him. 
Um, and, uh, and he did that at Bell Labs. Uh, he did that uh, wandering the halls in uh, Spanigal Hall. Um, and he had the open door policy. Um, you had to have, if you, if you were going to uh, do good work, sit in your office with your door open. You're going to get possibly less done, but you're going to be working on the right thing because people are going to come in and talk to you about ideas. You're not going to be in a closed environment, just working, thinking on, on your own. So, open door policy, and to this day, uh, I do that in many of Many of our colleagues do that as a result of Dick Hamming's uh, legacy. And by the way, uh, I have something that will eventually go into the library. I don't know how they're going to handle this, but it's Hamming's model railroad. <laughs> Welcome to NPS. <laughs> It's a little C-gauge railroad that his doctor, when he retired from, uh, from Bell Labs, told him that he should get a hobby. <laughs> well, he worked with this little Z-gauge model railroad, which is the smallest one they made, uh, and discovered that he could not, uh, uh, did not have the dexterity at age 75. Uh, 80 to to uh, to really do this, and so um, he had it on his coffee table, and and then he finally gave it to me, uh, and I have it on a table in my uh, in in my office, and ultimately it will go to the archives. <laughs> One final legacy that I, I want to mention, and that, that is what uh, Don Bretzman's going to talk about, and that is the, the Hamming course, which was affectionately called Hamming on Hamming. And uh, I'll turn it over to Don, and you, you can uh, hear about how that has Thank you, Marty, for this immense work. It's very important. I uh, first met Richard Hamming as a grad student here, master student. And wow, what an experience. Because uh, uh, first we had him for probability and statistics. And this was, uh, you know, our first quarter is computer science. And, uh, and uh, this is one of the giants of the field. I mean, the people he worked with, he invented a lot of this stuff. So we got to the midterm exam. And, uh, it was a statistically significant sample. We had 30 students in the room, and and he posts up posts up the grades, and it was a linear distribution from three points to 97 points on a scale of 100. Oh my goodness! So so we're all looking at that, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, Dr. Hamming says, uh, clearly, I've failed you. So we're going to do probability probability again for the second half. Like, okay, so he's, he's a very humble guy, he's a very direct guy. Uh, some of his stories are, are shocking that you can see on his uh, videos of his talks. Uh, really amazing. He was known as Hamming on Hamming because he put some people off. But he was telling stories in the first person and he mm -hmm. disclaimed it. He said, the only way I know how to communicate to you how to pursue the art of science and engineering is through his own experiences. He described one while he was at uh, Los Alamos, he was pacing the halls as he would tend to do when he was upset about something. And uh, his boss calls him in, Hanning, Hanning, what's the matter? And he says, well, we really don't know enough about the oxygen 18 cross-section of slow neutron absorption to predict what's going to happen in tomorrow's initial explosion. Translation, meaning we might ignite 2% of all the oxygen and thus the whole atmosphere. 
<laughs> on planet Earth. Okay. Serious? Big pause uh, in, in the class, and then his boss says, "Well, we we'll go it this way. If you're wrong, nobody will know about it." <laughs> that was our second big pause. So we had, a, we had a designated question asker, or our section leader in each pause, and uh, finally uh, he got the. Uh, so, so Dr. Hammond, did you tell your wife? <laughs> you know, you can imagine our eyes were like saucers by that point, and, and he said, uh, "Well, no, but it was very good to wake up the next morning." <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, he always challenged us. Uh, I am very happy to report we're going to show the videos again next quarter. They're online, but we're going to offer it as a course, just as he did. Uh, people can watch three videos a week. We have over 30 lectures, and then we get together on Friday afternoons. That was significant to him because he said, if you don't dedicate 10% of your time to thinking about the future, to thinking about how things get done, you're, you're not thinking about the future. So for him, that was Friday afternoons. Mm -hmm. So we want her in that manner. I uh, commend it to everyone. Thank the library for making it possible for us to keep building on this legacy, keep sharing it, because we all learn from Hamming every time we listen to him. So thank you all, and if we, I'm sure we have time for questions, or if more you sure. question over some. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, so, uh, and this is sort of about uh, Dick thinking about the future. Uh, I gave, uh, years ago I gave a talk on artificial neural networks uh, before it became descended for, for AI, uh, which is obviously incorrect. And Dick attended that. Uh, it was actually a day here at the Navy School. And um, uh, Dick had to leave early, so he interrupted me before he left, and he said, um, did I think that uh, you know, uh, artificial neural networks would uh, basically preclude future use of statistics? And I leave that to those people who know about those things to think about that, because that's a really interesting point. And uh, uh, I could talk for an hour or two with a chalkboard about that issue, but uh, it's kind of an interesting thing that we haven't even gotten there yet. But I think he actually saw that that's probably is what's going to happen to uh, statistics. Yeah, that's my Thank you. Good, just a counter back. In his quote, uh, which is, um, the um, subtitle of numerical methods for scientists and engineers, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. If all you do is program the computer and get a number, and you don't understand what those numbers mean, you're not really solving a problem. You just have an answer out of this random number generator. You need to understand the formulation. And so if he was here, I think that's what he might say as an answer to for my, for my work. Another question? I don't bite. <laughs> Professor Reeves. In, in your, in your uh, close relationship with uh, Dick Hanning, um, did you ever encounter him in any interface with Stanford and Fred Terman? I'm, I'm sorry, in, in any, any, in, any interface with Fred with, Terman, with Fred Terman at, at Stanford? At Stanford, while he was there. Um, no. No? No. I find nothing. And, and the interesting thing is, um, uh, we had on our faculty Fred Terman's son. Right. Uh, uh, and they did not have a relationship. There was magic in the air, said Hamming, when he and Claude Shannon worked together. And you have a relationship to Shannon was on your doctorate. Yes, he was on my doctoral committee. He asked the crucial question in the defense that caused me to go and, mm, and for another couple of weeks and work on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was and, and make a better result. Uh, that was, that was the same Shannon. kind of in, in questioning intellect, always asking the right fundamental question, going to the heart of the problem. From my research, that was Shannon, that was Hamming, 
That was Ling, that was McMillan, that was Tukey. They were the Young Turks. What a name. I wish I had a gang called the Young Turks. I know. Yes, sir. Oh, um, Dennis Marr from the Computer Center. Uh, I worked for Doug Williams, who was, and unfortunately he was not here to tell the story, but I found it so uh, charming, especially since we're talking about Shannon. Uh, you know, Computer Center was a, a, a operational uh, unit, so things had to get done, but Hamming would come by and he would uh, chat with uh, Doug Williams. Again, this whole idea of exchanging ideas. Well, at some point, uh, Professor Williams had to you know, go off and uh, do something else. So he found a surefire way of getting Hamming out of his office. He would just say something along as whatever the topic was. Well, didn't Shannon have some interesting ideas along this line? And Hamming would get less interested and leave. <laughs> Hamming and Shannon had a love-hate relationship with each other. Hamming was critical of some scientists. He was, in fact, critical of Albert Einstein, if you could imagine that, for staying so long with general relativity. Hamming believed that every five to seven years you need to reinvent yourself and go into a new area because you get dry. Um, he also was a strong believer in books and writing books. And Shannon had not written the book on information theory. It was just a short article in Bell Systems Technical Journal. And Hamming says, for God's sake, Shannon, you have to write this down or people don't know about it. It's as if you didn't do it. Yeah. And Shannon didn't do it. And so Hamming wrote the first book <laughs> of information theory. And then Shannon came up with this book. Um, a book is a magic thing. It's very important. <clears throat> Another question? Mm -hmm. Marty, will you tell us how Hamming um, stepped in, speaking of, of things, of such things, stepped in and asked you the question, how he actually became your advisor? Well, I'll try to keep this short because it goes nine pages in my research results. <laughs> Basically, I had made a tactical error when I came to NPS. I'm in the electrical engineering department. Don Kirk is the department head. And I looked for the professor who was, had published in the field I was doing, which was systems identification, it's modeling. Um, it's very close to signal processing, just the pro inverse problem. And so Sidney Parker had published a lot, and by God, he had most successful doctoral students. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? Wrong. They used the wrong metric. He was a theoretician. I'm an experimentalist. He didn't believe in computer simulated programs to prove something. He wanted necessary and conditioned, necessary and sufficient theoretical. So after four months, he is in red all over my first three chapters of my dissertation. This is not good, you gotta do this. You gotta prove necessary and sufficient conditions that something is true. And it was the uniqueness of a model. And I worked on it with all my energy, 18 hours a day. I lived in Herman Hall slept three hours, got up, showered, ate, came to my office in Spanagal on the second floor, worked and worked and worked and worked, came to Dudley Knox, couldn't solve it. Uh, Parker says, I don't think you're going to graduate. That hurt. Went to the department head, Don Kirk, and between Hamming, between Kirk and Parker, they said, we should send you to this guy Hamming. Here he's a good mathematician. He had been here a year. I go to Hamming and Hamming's looking at me with that, why am I listening to this guy? I told the school, I don't want doctoral students. They take a lot of time. They're smelly because they work 18 hours a day. And they're a problem. But then Hamming heard what I was doing, and it turns out what I was doing had a relationship with the last tech memo we had written two years earlier at Bell Labs, which I had no idea of knowing it until I started this research project. So Hamming, asked me a question which is brilliant in its simplicity, but I didn't see it. If you can't prove that something is true, can you demonstrate that it's false? Can you come up with a counterexample? So obvious. It was so obvious I didn't know it, and neither did anyone else help me. It took me two weeks, I came up with two counterexamples. And Hamming says, that's good. Okay, I'll take it.